Calvin, you gonna open us up in prayer? Yep, let's pray and we'll get started. Okay, sounds good. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for life and for health and for carrying us through this week. We thank you for your Sabbath that is here now. We just invite your Holy Spirit presence to be here with us as we go through this presentation, part three of a series, Lord, as we learn to wait on you and be faithful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. There is a quote by Sister White that goes like this. Many would be willing to work if they were taught how to begin. They need to be both instructed and encouraged. There's two things that the quote mentions, to be instructed and encouraged. Oftentimes, people are instructed, but they're not encouraged. Sometimes people are encouraged, they're not instructed, but we're instructed or admonished to do both of those two things. Our first two training sessions that we've had were focused more on instruction. And so I am being intentional and deliberate about tonight's message being one that's focused on being encouraging and inspiring so that all of you will want to be engaged in this weight training as we're waiting on the Lord to be active in soul winning and evangelism. And so I have specifically chosen this message because next week's message is going to be on how to do a Bible study and how to share doctrines. But, but, but before we get into that message, I'm hoping that through this message, you'll be encouraged and inspired. Now, slide please. It was just over a year and a half ago, I showed up at Auburn to this place called the quarry to go rock climbing. When I arrived, there was a very nice lady there that greeted me. I returned the greeting and I thought to myself, what a nice lady. I found my climbing buddy and we began climbing on the rock wall that's adjacent to this wall. We had been climbing for about an hour and a half. I was hanging from the harness, resting my arms when we heard somebody scream. Instinctively, we turned to look. We looked at this wall to see a climber falling. We expected the rope to catch the climber. The rope never caught the climber. The climber fell 70 feet and slammed into the ground. Immediately, my friend let me down. and I took off to call 911. My friend took off to the climber. As soon as I had spoken with 911, I came over to the climber who was lying there on the ground. The climber was breathing but unconscious. At this moment, our priority was not to move the climber because we did not want to risk any injuries to the climber's spinal cord. All we could do was wait for the medics to arrive. And as we we're waiting, I got down and I realized it was the same lady who had greeted me when I had first arrived to the climbing scene. All I could do was hold her hand and pray for her. And the thought that was looming on my mind was, does this woman know Jesus? Did somebody tell her about Jesus, that God would preserve her life if she didn't know Jesus? Pretty soon, another climber appeared on the scene who was a firefighter. He began to assess the situation. And as soon as this climber stopped breathing, her pulse was gone. Our priorities completely changed. Our priority was no longer to try and protect her spinal cord. Our priority now was to save her life. We picked her up and moved her about 10 feet to a flat area, laid her on her back, and we began doing chest compressions on her. I've been a dentist for over 23 years. I take refresher courses in CPR every other year, and I've never done CPR on a live person before. And now here, frantically, we are trying to save her life. As we were doing chest compressions, her phone rang. I picked it up. It was her oldest son calling. I had to tell him that his mother had been in a climbing accident, that we were doing CPR, and that the medics were on their way, and her son was frantic. They tried to land a helicopter, but they could not because it was too dangerous to land a helicopter between the two rock walls. It seemed like forever that we were doing chest compressions when the medics finally arrived. When they came, they began to shock her. They gave her epinephrine. We picked her up and put her onto a spinal board. They put her in a utility vehicle and they were racing off to the hospital. In route to the hospital, the message came through to the ranger that they had pronounced her dead. I already knew she was going to die because I saw her die in front of me. I saw all the color leave her face. 
I thought I was okay that evening, but I had trouble sleeping that night. I'd never seen somebody die before. It was the most traumatic thing that I had ever seen before in my life. That next morning, I messaged her son, Austin. He told me it was the most heartbreaking moment of his life. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide. Crystal Reber, 44-year-old beautiful mother of two boys. One moment it was a beautiful day outdoors. The next moment her day had come to an end. Next slide. Two weeks later, I was sitting at her funeral listening to her eulogy. It was a humble reminder that life is fragile. Life is fleeting. Life is so unpredictable. Next slide. Just a couple of summers ago, there was a plane crash in Angwin, California. This hit close to home for me, not because it occurred right there next to Pacific Union College where I went to college, but because I knew one of the passengers that was in this plane. Next slide. Shauna Waite was on this plane with her husband. They were both 37 years old. And her father, who was 73, was piloting the Beechcraft Bonanza airplane. All three of them died. Three years ago, Shauna and I were on a running team together. She was an amazing person. She loved animals. She was a veterinarian, had a heart of service and a love for people. My heart was heavy for Shauna's mother, who in just one moment lost her husband, daughter, and son-in-law. Next slide. My heart was heavy for the one-year-old baby boy, Kieran, who had just lost his mother, father, and grandfather. At one year of eight, their little boy, while not being able to comprehend what has happened, I just imagined that the little boy must have sensed that something was missing in his life, that two people who gave him so much love were no longer there. Shauna and I had connected because she had messaged me about joining me on a mission trip that I was organizing. She texted me, I know I couldn't make this one, but would love to come on another one. At the young age of 37, her aspirations and opportunities were cut short. In scripture, we find metaphors and intermittent reminders about the brevity of life. In the book of Psalms, Moses encourages us to ask God to teach us to number our days. Why are we encouraged to number our days? Because there is a clarity of vision that comes from contemplating the shortness of life. It is as we contemplate the brevity of life, we need to be compelled to examine our life, to take inventory, to prioritize our life. I asked myself, if I was on that airplane with my father, what would my last final moments look like? What would I say? What would I do? And it wasn't hard to imagine at all what I would say. I say to my, if I was on that airplane with my wife and my father, I say to my wife, honey, I love you, honey. I love you so much. I say to my dad, dad, I love you, dad. I say to my wife, we need to call the kids right now. And if we were able to get a hold of the kids, I say to the kids, Karis and Kaya, you need to listen to mommy and daddy very carefully because our plane is not going to make it. We want to tell you how much we love you. We're so proud of you. We want to tell you how blessed we are to be your parents. We want to tell you how much we want to ask that we want to ask that you would forgive us for any time we were anything less than the best parents that we could be for you guys. Karis, you need to take care of your younger sister, Kaya. Karis and Kaya, we want you to promise mommy and daddy that you will be faithful to Jesus. And someday we will see you again. We want to pray with you right now. We love you guys so much. And I will submit that for everyone that is listening, under the same circumstances, your conversation would be either very similar or almost identical. Why? Because it's intuitive. It's instinctive. It doesn't have to be scripted. We already know what matters most in life. Because when we come face to face with our mortality, what matters most will not be your bank account. It will not be your real estate. It will not be how many followers you have on social media. What matters most 
would be, will my loved ones be in heaven? What have I done to increase or decrease the population of heaven? What have I done for others that God has put in my life? What have I done for Jesus? As a missionary, next slide, C.T. Studd put it best. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. I want to frame this evening's message under the obvious implication that life is fleeting. Life is unpredictable. And in light of what truly matters most, how do we want to live our lives? The title of this presentation is One Life to Live, One Life to Give. I'm going to ask that you pray with me one more time as we continue on. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I just want to ask, Lord, that you would speak through me in this message, that we would hear a word from heaven. Teach us to live wisely. Teach us to number our days. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you could meet one person in the world, who would it be and why? For me, there was only one person I'd always wanted to meet. It was my favorite sports hero, Dick Hoyt. When I mention his name, most of you may not know who he is, but when I tell you his story, most of you may have heard of his story. Next slide. Dick Hoyt and his wife Judy had a son. Isn't he a beautiful baby boy? When he was born, he had the umbilical cord wrapped around his neck and he was deprived of oxygen. He came out as a spastic quadriplegic with cerebral palsy. The doctor said he would be a vegetable. He encouraged the parents to just put him into an institution. When he came out, cognitively, he was all there, but he could not speak and he could not walk. Imagine being trapped in a human prison. Next slide. Some of you may recognize Dick and Rick Hoyt. At 10 years of age, Tufts University created a communicating device for Rick. He could communicate by tapping his head onto a computer device like this one letter at a time. You can see the book on his lap. That's his biography. It's entitled One Letter at a Time. Could you imagine communicating just one letter at a time? When he first typed out on that computer, his dad thought he would say, hi, dad. His mom thought he would say, hi, mom. He typed out G-O-B-R-U-I-N-S, go Bruins, because they were hockey fans. When Rick was 15 years old, he wanted to participate in a five-mile benefit race for a lacrosse player at a school who had become paralyzed. Rick asked his dad if they could run the race. There was only one problem. Dick was 36 years old, and Dick was not a runner. Great fathers, however, make sacrifices. Great fathers give up their time, money, and physical energy for the sake of giving their children a better life, or sometimes just merely for a smile. His son's request was all the motivation that he needed. He agreed and pushed his son's wheelchair the full five miles. Next slide. They finished the race second to last. It was so hard, Dick had blood coming out of his urine for two weeks and he was wiped out. When they got home, Rick typed out a message to his dad on the computer that would change the course of their life forever. He typed out, Dad, when I'm running, it feels like my disability disappears. Imagine how a father of a disabled child would feel to have his son say that to him, that when he is running, it feels like his disability disappears. At that moment, Dick discovered his mission in life. That even if it was only for just five minutes, for 10 minutes, for 20 minutes, or even for one hour, if he could make his son to not feel disabled, he would do whatever it took to give everything for his son. And while Rick was at school, Dick put a bag of cement inside Rick's wheelchair and he began to run. Next slide. Look at this pic. Dick is plum tuckered out and look at the smile on Rick's face. Over the next three and a half decades. Next slide. The pair set, achieved, and surpassed not only their own goals, but also everyone's expectations of a father carrying, towing, and pushing his wheelchair-bound adult son. Next slide. Over 1,100 races, marathons, triathlons, duathlons, Boston Marathon 32 times, and six full Ironmans. Next slide. For those of you who don't know what an Ironman is, in an Ironman, you swim 2.4 miles, 
you bike 112 miles, and then you run a full 26.2 mile marathon. I've done two of those. It's hard enough for me to do this by myself. Can you imagine doing this while pushing, pulling, and towing an adult grown son? They have even ran and biked across the entire United States. Next slide. Just to give you an idea of their accomplishments. Do we have any marathon runners in this audience here? Anyone who does a marathon for most people, for beginners, their goal is to get in and do a marathon under four hours. If you can do a marathon in under three hours, that is a huge goal for any serious runner to be a sub three marathoner. His fastest marathon, just so you have an idea, the Olympic and the, and the fastest runners in the world are coming in just over two hours. While pushing his son in a wheelchair at the Marine Corps Marathon, his fastest marathon was two hours and 40 minutes. You have no idea how fast that is. Wow. I had a running coach and she ran a two hour and 44 minute marathon and that qualified her for the Olympic trials. While they have never broken any records for time, speed or dis distance, they've broken every record for devotion, for perseverance, courage, inspiration and showing hope to others. Rick was once asked if he could give his father one thing, what would it be? He said, the thing I'd most like is for my dad to sit in the chair and I would push him for once because Rick loved his daddy. Next slide. Um, Three Cal, years. Cal, yep. can I ask you a quick question? Yep. Did you say that they did, did you say that they did the, the Iron Man together? Six of them. So the, the swimming too? Yep. He tows his son in a raft while he swims and then carries him and then puts him on the bike and then he pushes him for the whole marathon. Are you kidding me? I will, I will encourage you guys. I'll send you a link so you can watch videos on YouTube. It will, it will bring tears to your eyes. They're I so am, inspirational. I am a huge sports fan and I was like, who is he talking about? Like, I'm, like, I'm, like I'm sick on trivia and everything. And I was like, I just got schooled today. This is my new favorite athlete, please. That's, that's why he's the one person I'd always wanted to meet. And three years ago, I was in Boston for the Boston Marathon. And one of the people, the only person I wanted to meet was Dick Coit. And I got to meet Dick here at the wow. Boston Marathon. And I'm wow. so glad I got to meet him. Um, and when I did, I told him I was his biggest fan. And maybe he believed me because he stepped out of line and we just chatted. And he asked me for my contact information. And three weeks later, when I got home, he sent me gifts, books, and even something for my daughter. And um, it gets even better than that. Every once in a while on my Facebook post, he would actually comment on my Facebook but I'm so glad I got to meet him because just, just about a year and a half ago, he passed away at the age of 80. And I got to meet him just four years ago. Next slide. Through Dick and Rick's story, I've gotten a beautiful glimpse of God's love for me, pushing me, pulling me, and carrying me through the vicissitudes of life. What is it that motivated Dick to do this? It's a four-letter word. L-O-V-E. It's the greatest motivator there ever was. For God so loved the world that he gave. You love, you give. The famous French general, Napoleon Bonaparte, once said, Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and I have founded empires. But on what did we rest the creations of our genius? Upon force. Jesus Christ founded his empire upon love, and at this hour, millions of men would die for him. Love is the greatest motivator there ever was. Dick had a mission in life and it was fueled and motivated by love. You and I, we already know what our mission in life is. Ours is to share the light of saving truth with the world in darkness. If we love Jesus with all of our heart, fulfilling our mission should be a joy. It will not be a duty. It will be a privilege and an honor. Next slide. Trayson is a 25 year old patient of mine he was a basketball star in high school. Life is grand when you're a basketball star in high school. After high school, during practice, he broke his ankle and during a routine surgery, they accidentally severed his sciatic nerve while giving him a nerve block. He became disabled in his left leg. He suffers from CRPS, which is ranked as the most painful form of chronic pain. Unlikely to ever run or play basketball ever again. You got dreams? Trey had dreams too, and his dreams were crushed into pieces. Trey told me, I can't even walk my dog. 
Trey was a great patient. And when he'd come into my office, you know what I'd bring up? I'd bring up basketball because when we talked about basketball, he would light up. During one of his dental visits, I asked him, how would you like to do Bible studies? He said, I need to because I'm starting to resent God. During one of our Bible studies, he told me that on a scale of 1 to 10, the pain in his leg is a 12. But it's not so much the pain in his leg that bothered him as much as the void in his life. The emptiness in his life that he could not fill. I could relate because when I was in the world, I experienced that void in my life and only Jesus could fill it. I'm no cardiothoracic surgeon, but even the best surgeon in the world cannot fill that void in his heart. But you and I know somebody who alone that can fill that void in Trayson's heart. We know someone who can even give Trayson a new heart. After Trey went to church with me on Sabbath for his very first time, that evening he told me that he was experiencing peace in his life that he had not felt in a very long time. Next slide. Over a year and a half ago, I had the privilege and honor of baptizing Trey. Trey still struggles with chronic pain, but now he has peace and joy in his life because he has Jesus. Now, I'll be honest, I wasn't always earnest and ardent about soul winning. Many years ago, I invited a young man to my home. I wanted to talk about some of the issues we were having in our local church. I wanted a sounding board for my complaints and have someone to affirm my complaints. The young man said to me, are you giving any Bible studies? It was an awkward moment for me, and I was being gently rebuked as I knew exactly the point that he was making. In essence, what he was saying to me was, unless you're rowing the boat, you have no business rocking the boat. The conversation left a lasting impression that I need to be about the business of giving Bible studies. Do I want to be a part of the solution or part of the problem stirring the proverbial pot? Today, our church has no shortage of people who are rocking the boat. Our church is plagued with divisive issues, and you know what they are. Paul admonishes us, let there be no divisions among you. What is even worse than the divisive issues in our church is the way that our church members are treating others with contempt and scorn towards those who hold opposing views or positions. We see church members reviling others. Do you know what it means to revile? It means to criticize in an abusive or angrily insulting manner. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 6.10, Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Next slide. In 1948, the Palomore Observatory in San Diego, California was being dedicated. At that time, the 200-inch Hale Telescope was the largest telescope in the world. In light of the expanse of the cosmos with billions and billions of stars and galaxies. I want to share just a snippet from the dedication speech. Next slide. Listen carefully to the simple but profound juxtaposition being underscored in the speech. Here it goes. In the face of these supreme mysteries and against this majestic background of space and time, the petty squabbling of nations on this small planet is not only irrelevant, but contemptible. Adrift in a cosmos whose shores he cannot even imagine, man spends his energies in fighting with his fellow man over issues which a single look through this telescope would show to be utterly inconsequential. I cannot help but apply a spiritual perspective to the sentiment. Here is my revision. In the face of eternal realities and against the majestic context of souls that were redeemed at an infinite price, at an infinite risk, the petty squabbling of church members on this small planet is not only irrelevant, but contemptible. Adrift in a cosmos whose shores we cannot even imagine, man spends his energies in fighting with his fellow church members over issues which a single look through the lens of the plan of redemption for man was show to be really inconsequential. I want us to be reminded that as a worldwide church, there's much more that unites us than divides us. And what unites us is much more important than what divides us. Testimonies for the church gives us the solution. Here's what Sister White says. If they would work to win souls to Christ, they'll forget self and the desire to save souls. They will see so much work to do. So many fellow beings to help that they will have no time to look for faults in others. They will have no time to work on the negative side. The world and our church has problems. 
I truly believe that soul winning is the only solution for both the world and for our church. There are no other solutions. There is no leader strategy or policy that can solve the problems we have because at its core, it is a sin problem. I believe that if everyone was engaged in soul winning, most all the problems in our church would disappear. I was out running with a buddy of mine who's a missionary from the 1040 window. I asked him about what position the missionaries held on a certain controversial issue in our church. He laughed because the missionaries don't care. They are too busy focused on soul winning. In the middle of COVID, I was talking on the phone with my buddy, Ernest Palm. During our conversation, he told me he had 20 people he was studying the Bible with. I was inspired, but I was also rebuked. I had just one patient with whom I was studying the Bible with. I was inspired and moved by Ernest. I've got one life to live. I've got one life to give. How do I want to be spending my time? I knelt down and I prayed and I asked God if he would give me 20 people to study the Bible with. Within five months, God had given me over 20 Bible study contacts. I had never been busier in my life, but never happier. And there's nothing else that I love to talk about more. Next slide. Ricky is an automotive mechanic for Toyota. Ricky had a disdain for one of his fellow workers, Brad, who was a proverbial goody two-shoes. Brad was a Seventh-day Adventist, and Brad would get on Ricky's nerves. Someone could be rude and unprofessional, and Brad always had to have a positive attitude. This seemed fake and self-righteous to Ricky. He would voice to Brad, stop being fake, be real. This ain't who you is. Stop acting like you're okay with this. Ricky would rib him and try to push his buttons to get him to react, but Brad never faltered. Over time, Ricky observed Brad's consistency in what was disdain and annoyance, slowly turned into admiration and respect. Ricky eventually decided he wanted what Brad had. He told me, I want what this guy has and whatever he's a part of, I want to be a part of it. As I gave Ricky Bible studies, his 15-year-old son began to study with us. I had the privilege of baptizing Ricky, I think last year. I love it. Someone says, I know. Oh, I know a Ricky. Next slide. But it gets even better. After his baptism, his wife said she wanted Bible studies. At our first Bible study, I asked her why she wanted Bible studies. She told me it was because of the changes she had seen in her husband's life. This is the essence of the gospel. The gospel is all about change. As Ricky saw Brad's consistent example, it moved him to want what Brad had. And as Ricky's wife saw the changes in her husband, she now wanted what he had. Calvin? Yes. Um, so when you, uh, when you do a Bible study, mm -hmm. um, do you have a certain plan when you go into it? Or do you just let them ask questions and then you find scripture to go along with it? Uh, or do you do you have a specific a specific um, course plan or anything like that? Or is it yep. sort of, okay? I'm gonna go over I'm gonna go over all that um, next week. But okay. unless they have a, unless they're dealing with a certain issue and we have to address something, then I have a specific way of doing things, and um, I love talking about it. But I'm gonna be sharing all that at our next meeting, I think, in two weeks. So you awesome. guys will know. And you know what, Sister White tells us that. You know, soul winning is a science. It's the highest of all sciences. So there is a method and there's a there's a better way and ways that are not as effective. And so it's something that's definitely something that um, I, I, I will be sharing about all that. So awesome. great. Yeah. So I love it. Great question. Now, I foresaw one major obstacle. Their son, Iverson, had been boxing since he was two years old. He was 15. That's practically his entire life. I met his boxing coach at his father's baptism and his father's, his, his coach said he was an amazing boxer. Next slide. Next slide. The problem is boxing matches are usually on Sabbath and destroying your opponent in the ring is a little antithetical to the gospel. At our second Bible study with the family, they shared that Iverson had quit boxing. I was in awe. 
His dad mentioned to me about the Sabbath conflict. It was amazing. As these people are wanting to study the Bible, they're since and they're uh, they were really truly converted. These things that they held on to, it was so easy for them to let go. I can only praise God. I've done a lot of exciting things in my life, and I will tell you that there is nothing that compares to leading someone to Jesus and then taking them all the way to baptism. Sister White tells us there is no greater bliss on this side of heaven than in winning souls to Christ. And I can attest to the veracity of this quote. Next slide. Next slide. This is Iverson. Next slide. This is his mother. I had the privilege of baptizing her as well. Next slide. I'm finding that if we make ourselves available, God will allow us to cross paths with people who are searching for truth. One of my patients, Jordan, was searching for truth. Do you know how young people search for truth these days? They go on YouTube, and it can be a jungle out there. I had asked his grandfather if he wanted Bible studies. And while his grandfather wasn't interested, he encouraged his grandson, Jordan, to study the Bible with me. Jordan showed up with his wife, and they were like sponges. They were soaking it up. I had the privilege of studying with them and then taking them both all the way to baptism. I've never seen so much interest in my life among people for Bible studies. I believe it's twofold. One is, it's because of the times that we are living in. People are seeking for answers. And I also believe that the Holy Spirit is being poured out. I had shared a 15-minute version of this message at a local ASI event. A friend of mine, Rebecca, heard me share. She went home and prayed and asked God that he would give her people to study the Bible with. The first four people she asked all said yes. She was so excited as she was telling me about it over the phone. I told her on the phone that at the time, it seemed that for every four to five people that I ask, I get one Bible study. Rebecca exclaimed, I'm at 100% because everyone I've asked has said yes. I told her, you're doing better than I am. I was so happy for her. Just as I had prayed and Rebecca had prayed for Bible study contacts, I hope that many of you would pray and ask God to give you Bible study contacts as I know that this is a prayer that God delights to answer. I know it can be intimidating to ask someone if they want Bible studies. This was a text from Trayson, my 25-year-old patient, the one I shared the story about, the one that was a basketball star in high school. Next slide. He sent me this text. Oh, it's, I'm sorry, it's not on here. He said, hey, go back to that previous slide, please. Here's what his text said. Hey, I just want to let you know how thankful I am for you. I said yes to a Bible study and it changed my life. Thank you. What if I hadn't asked him if he wanted Bible studies? I would have missed the opportunity to make a difference in Trey's life. Do you need revival in your life? Are any of you struggling spiritually? I'm going to tell you why I believe people struggling struggle spiritually. This is from my own personal experience as well as my observation of others. You know, in 2009, Pastor Ivers shared with me this idea for starting a ministry called Army Bible Camp. And I was like, wow, this is an opportunity for me to work with Pastor Ivor Myers. I said, okay, we put a team together and that's how, and God blessed. And that's how Army Bible Camp got started. And the purpose of Army was to, people kept asking Pastor Ivor, how do you study the Bible? Can you teach us? So one of the things was to teach people how to study the Bible. And so Pastor Ivor, not only him, we'd invite other speakers, and they would teach how to study the Bible. But prayer also became a huge part of Army Bible Camp. At the first event, we had a prayer meeting in the morning, and eventually we had a prayer room where people could pray all day long. Eventually, on Thursday nights, we'd have an all-night prayer. And so the two things that would happen at this event was nonstop prayer, and then teaching people how to study the Bible, and the Holy Spirit would be poured out, and come Saturday night, we'd have testimony night. And people would share amazing stories of healing and breakthrough. And people would be in tears. And on Sunday, when the event ended, after the final message, we'd hold hands, sing side by side, and we would leave. And we had a mountaintop experience. We were on a spiritual high. Do you know what would happen after about a week or two? Everybody who had a spiritual high... Most of us, we'd crash and burn. 
And you know what? Each time I left, I'd be on such a mountaintop experience. And I would say, you know what? I'm going to spend more time studying my Bible. I'm going to spend more time praying. And you know what? After a week or two, we kind of go right back into the valley. We had a couple on our team and they would say, tell us, I got to come back to army so I can get basically spiritually revived again. And if you think about that, it's not the, it's, it's horrible. When people are like, they, they had to come back to camp so they can get spiritually resuscitated. Looking back, do you know what? You know what I have put my finger on as the, as the issue? We were teaching people how to study the Bible. We were teaching people how to pray. But what we weren't doing is Pastor Ivo would give an amazing presentation on the blueprint, which I'm going to talk about that because that's part of my Bible study that I give. But we were not giving instruction on how to share and witness. Next slide. We know from the holy place in the sanctuary. Next slide, please. Next slide. We know that from this sanctuary model that you and I are not courtyard Christians. We are to be in the holy place. You all, I'm sure, are all familiar with this. We have the table of shoe bread, which represents the word of God. It's how God speaks to us. We have the altar of incense, which represents our prayers, how we speak to God. And we have the seven branch candlesticks, which represents our light to the world, our witness. Seven to the seven seas, to the seven continents. And you and an army, we were really focused on the table of shoe bread. There was a lot of prayer going on, but we weren't arming and teaching the people to go out and share their faith like we could have, like we're doing on this um, series with weight training because I really believe that if we were teaching people to share their faith they'd be experiencing regular and active revival because I have observed a common denominator amongst the happiest on fire Christians they are always actively sharing their faith get engaged in sharing and soul winning and experience revival in your personal life on a daily basis when I am sharing Jesus with others I become a channel for God's love to flow through me. Oftentimes, I will find myself sharing just the words that I needed to hear to be encouraged and inspired. And I walk away from the Bible studies with a fresh revelation of God's love for me. And I'm on fire spiritually. Brother you, Kevin? Yes. We have, a, we have a couple questions in chat when sure. you're ready. Yes. Um, Sister Diane says, how do you find the confidence that you know enough to lead a Bible study? I'm going to talk about that next week. Great question. Okay. Let's start off with a story that's going to help you with that. Because, because the number one reason why people don't want to give a Bible study is because of fear. Fear of not knowing what to say. Fear of getting asked a question. So I'm going to address all that. So make sure you join us in two weeks. All right? Um, so excellent question. Was there another question? Um, Sherry has her hand. I can't tell. She's got a little hand up emoji, but I can't tell if she has a question or she's just testifying. So I, I'll, I'll wait. I'll wait and chat. <laughs> Amen. So if, if anybody here is a runner, let me tell you, if you want to be a great marathoner, it requires three things. You have to train. You have to be running, but you can't run every day. You need rest and recovery. You need to give your body rest. Some days you run and do a slow run in order for your muscles to recover. Third, you need nutrition and hydration. It requires all three. You can train seven days a week you don't, and you can eat all the healthiest foods, but you don't rest your body. You will not become a successful marathoner. You know what? You can rest your body all the time. Eat as healthy as you can and drink and get plenty of water. But if you don't train, you will not be a successful marathoner. You have to do all things, all three things. When you look at a river, in order for a river to stay healthy, you know what it's got to do? It's got to keep moving. You know what happens to water when it pulls up and it stagnates? It becomes a breeding ground for parasites, for bacteria and mosquitoes. In order for water to be healthy, it's got to move. And as it ebbs and flows and it drops, it gets aerated. And now it's able to provide life-giving oxygen to the invertebrates and to the fish in the water. In the same way, as Christians, you want to experience revival? We've got to be active. And how do we do that? we got to let our light shine. There's only one miracle that is mentioned in all four of the Gospels. Does anyone know what miracle that is? 
It is the feeding of the 5,000. The miracle of the five loaves and two fish. There's also the feeding of the 4,000. And in the Old Testament, there's also stories of where bread was multiplied. Now, Jesus asked his disciples to feed the people. Do you know what the disciples' reply was? We have but five loaves and two fish. In essence, what they were saying is, we don't have enough to share. We say this all the time. Lord, we don't know how to give Bible studies. We don't have the resources. We don't have time. And Jesus says, just give me what you got. He takes what they have. He prays and he blesses it. And you know the story, he multiplies it. This story underscores the important spiritual lesson that we are to come to Jesus each morning and he will give us food to share. You and I are the disciples. We share with the multitudes. We come back to Jesus, he gives us more and it never runs out. In this story, who do you think was having the most fun? I'm confident it was the disciples. Do you think this was like the most exciting for Jesus? I don't think this was that exciting for Jesus. This was no new trick for Jesus. The, the multitude didn't know what was going on, or they may have, but I'm confident it was the disciples who were having the most fun. In the desire of ages, regarding this story, we are told, we must impart, well, I'm sorry, we must receive to impart. Only as we impart can we receive more. As we continue imparting, we continue to receive. And the more we impart, the more we shall receive. Do you see why sharing is so critical to revival? Unless you're sharing, Jesus is not going to give you more. Listen to this very profound quote that we're told in evangelism by Sister White. She says, light is only given to those who will reflect that light upon others. If you're not, sh if you're not sharing the light that you have, you're not getting more light. And if you're not getting more light, and in John, light is synonymous with life. If you're not receiving that life, well, then you're not going to be experiencing revival. So you want to you, you want to experience a revival in your life? Share what you got. There's nothing like giving a Bible study, and God brings to my mind, at the right moment, a story, an illustration, or a Bible text that is perfectly adapted for the situation, to know that God is speaking through me, and to feel his love and power in a most palpable, intangible way. Do any of you struggle with fear? anxiety, or stress. You know, the things that used to stress me out the most were things that were related to my office and my work. You know, office problems don't stress me out as much like they used to. You know why? Because I've got way more important things that I'm dealing with. I'm dealing with souls of people. You know, people say 40 is over the hill. I'm going to tell you it's not true. It's 45. Then it starts going downhill. I had no problems until I turned 45. And then you know what? I had to start wearing reading glasses. I can't read without reading glasses. I'm struggling to remember people's names. And you know what? My hair started to recede. I always had a lot of plenty of hair, but now my hair is starting to recede. It used to really bother me. But you know what? My receding hairline doesn't bother me anymore. Do you know why? My hair on top is now starting to thin. This is a way bigger problem. I never knew what creating volume meant. I do now. I hope you get the point that I'm making. When you have more important things to deal with, the other things become trivial. In soul winning, we are dealing with the most important matters, things of eternal consequences, the destiny of men and women, and most other things will become trivial and insignificant. Our ministry, I was part of a ministry after Army Bible Camp called F5 Challenge, and our focus is on friendship evangelism. It's on utilizing hobbies and outdoor activities to get people outside to do things to improve their health, but to use it to connect with people. Let me give you an example. It's much easier to invite somebody to go hiking than it is to invite them to go to church. But once I invite them to go hiking and they meet my friends and we have a good time and we build bridges, then when I do invite them to church, they already know people because they met them hiking. So that's just a kind of an example of of what, what our mission is with, with F5 Challenge. It's all about friendship evangelism and our internal motto is fitness for witness. Now, we were holding one of our annual events at the Zion National Park a few years ago. We had a young man coming who had muscular dystrophy. His name is Shu and he had not been on a hike for over 20 years as he was wheelchair bound. 
His sister contacted me, asked me if there were any hikes that we could take his brother on. When I looked online, there was a few paved trails, but nowhere we could really take our friend. And so inspired by Dick Hoyt and his example, I proposed to our team. I said, you know what? Let's carry him and take him to the top of Angel's Landing. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide. For those of you who don't know what Angel's Landing is, Angel's Landing is one of the top 10 most famous and popular hikes in the world. But it's also one of the top 10 probably most dangerous hikes in the world as you're hiking along and it's literally sheer cliffs off to the side. We assembled a team of 32 people. Next slide. And we wheeled him in his wheelchair as far as we could go. There I'm pushing from behind, but we have a rope attached and the people in front are pulling the rope. Next slide. Then we took turns and carried him. Next slide. And this is us taking turns, carrying him. Most of us were rock climbers. So of course we had harnesses, we had ropes, we were clipping in. So we, we made it pretty safe. Next slide. <clears throat> this is us at the top, once we had gotten to the top. The adventure was moving for all of us, but it was life changing for Shu. Pre previously, he was in a very dark place in his life. And this experience completely changed his life. Now, we were not expecting this, but the story made the news. We even got featured on Inside Edition. Next slide. But here is why I'm telling you the story. There, next slide. There are people on our team who have a legitimate fear of heights. However, not one person that I know of on our team complained or was crippled by their fear of heights. Why do you suppose this was? I'm going to tell you. It's because everyone was focused on getting Shu to the top and they forgot about their own problems. Do you struggle with fear and worry? Focus on getting others to heaven. It's the best way to forget about your own problems. It is the key to true happiness. Now, as we come near to an end, I want us to look at two characters in the Bible that I am hoping will put all of this into perspective. Next slide. Lot and Noah. These two men have many things in common. Jesus mentions both of these men by name in Luke 17. By virtue of the fact that Jesus specifically mentions these two men by name, I think they deserve our careful consideration. What do they have in common? You can start putting in the chat box things that they have in common. Both were men. It's good to start with things that are simple when you're doing comparing and contrast. They were both husbands. Lot and Noah were both fathers. They both live through judgment time. Oh, I like that. Lineage of Jesus. They were obedient to God. Both are mentioned in the book of Genesis. They both lived among a time of great sin. Both tried to save other people. Now, they also both got drunk, so they weren't perfect. Both experienced a close of probation. When the doors of the ark closed, Probation had closed for the antediluvians. In Genesis 19, it says the angels pulled Lot in and shut the door. In the Bible, the door being shut refers to close of probation. While they have many things in common, I want to shift our attention to the variances between these two. For Noah, it was destruction by water or flood. For Lot, it was destruction by fire. For Noah, it was a worldwide destruction. For Lot, it was localized. Noah knew for 120 years that Judgment Day was coming. Lot only knew for about 12 hours from dusk to dawn. Noah understood his mission in life and everything that he did was colored by his mission. Lot was focused on procuring himself a comfortable life in the here and now. Lot was a good man, but he wasn't living out his God-given mission. Lot was busy keeping up with the Joneses. Noah was busy keeping up with Jesus, the mission that Jesus had given him to do. Noah was, was busy preaching a present truth message. Lot was not preaching a present truth message. Noah was prepared for the coming judgment. Lot was caught by total surprise 
by the coming judgment. Noah and Lot represent two classes of people that will be in heaven. There will be people like Noah. Because he understood his mission in life, he went for broke. He went all in. He left nothing on the table. As a result, his entire family was saved. There will be people in heaven like Lot. And while they are saved into God's kingdom, at what cost? He lost his wife, his other daughters, and sons-in-law. Only two of his daughters were saved. Patriarchs and prophets tells us about Noah, that all that he possessed, he invested in the ark. What was the net result? When judgment had passed, Noah retained his entire investment. He lost nothing. It's called laying up your treasure in heaven. Conversely, Lot lost everything he owned except the shirt on his back. Noah had prepared for 120 years. When judgment day came, Noah and his family were fully prepared and they could face a time of trouble with confidence and edge. How would you like to have that kind of peace of mind and freedom as our world is unraveling? Lot was completely blindsided. We are told Lot was paralyzed by the great calamity and stupefied with grief. Do you know what it means to be stupefied? It means unable to think or feel properly. He is in sheer panic as he is trying to convince his other children to flee the coming destruction. You and I, we already know our mission in life. We are living in judgment hour. We have a present truth message to preach. The everlasting gospel of the three angels' messages and preparation of Jesus' soon return. Do we want to be like Noah or Lot? As we juxtapose these two characters and examine their lives from the perspective of the end of their lives. The answer is so obvious, isn't it? Mother Teresa summarized it so succinctly. Next slide, please. God has called us not to be successful, but to be faithful. Being in ministry from time to time, I'll have a mother come to me in near tears as her heart is breaking for her wayward son or daughter. There may be some of you in the audience who can relate. Listen carefully to one of my favorite quotes from patriarchs and prophets that I like to share with these mothers whose heart is broken for their wayward child. This is what it says in patriarchs and prophets speaking of Noah. Next slide. As a reward for his faithfulness and integrity, God saved all the members of his family with him. What encouragement to parental fidelity. By virtue of the last sentence that encourages us to parental fidelity, this tells me that you and I may also be privy to special blessings and rewards if we are faithful. We know that God cannot save someone who doesn't want to be saved, but we also know that God can bestow special blessings upon his children. So let you and I be faithful like Noah was, and then put everything in God's hands. When you get to heaven, what is the first thing that you are going to want to do? Are you going to want to check out your heavenly bank account? See how much treasure you have stored up in heaven? Are you going to want to go see that swanky new mansion? Because Jesus has promised all a new mansion when we get to heaven. Or are you going to go want to go swim with the dolphins or swim with the sharks or play with the lions? I will assure you that when you get to heaven, there are only going to be two things that will matter to you when you get to heaven. You're going to want to see your loved ones, your friends, and your family. Those you have won into God's kingdom. And the only other thing that's going to matter is you're going to want to meet and see Jesus. Those are the only two things that will matter. Everything else is just going to be a bonus. If those are the only two things that matter when we get to heaven, maybe those are the two things that we should focus most on while we are here on this earth. You and I, we have a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to win souls for God's kingdom. In heaven, we'll never have this opportunity ever again. What if we go all in, go for broke, leave nothing on the table, and win as many souls as we can for God's kingdom? We have one life to live. We have one life to give. How do you want to live your life? Next slide. As C.T. Studd put it best, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. If you bow your heads and you pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, 
I just want to thank you that you are willing to risk failure and eternal loss to send your son to come and die that we might have life. I pray that you will help us to live wisely. Lord, help us to redeem the time so that Jesus may receive the full reward for his suffering and his sacrifice. Help us to be faithful. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Calvin. Thank you. We uh, uh -huh. you mentioned you mentioned the um, friendship evangelism, and um, we have Pastor Meyer started um, the small groups here based on that friendship evangelism, where people take their hobbies um, and things like that, and will use that to evangelize to people who might not necessarily be Adventist or Christian yet, but because they're into motorcycles or they're into crocheting, they get an opportunity to hang out and talk. So um, I, I haven't heard it phrased that way as friendship evangelism, but I'm definitely going to use that. Oh, I love it. I mean, that's just the best way. You find something in common with somebody and you automatically connect. And so that's the best way. Build those bridges first. Amen. So, Amen. Love it. Hey, so you Calvin. guys, you guys, we're off next week, and um, Calvin has agreed to do one more session um, for us. So that's so awesome. So it won't be next week, but the following week. I'm sorry, Pastor, I probably interrupted you. My bad. No, I was just gonna say, Calvin, that was uh, that was excellent, man. Uh, that was a blessing, and oh, yes, um, Lord. yeah, uh, just very timely words, examples, everything. Praise God. God is good. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, thank you for having me on here. Um, you know, God has been merciful and kind to me, so I've got to redeem the time. And if I can inspire even just every time one person says to me, you know, because of something that I shared, that they were encouraged to go ask someone for a Bible study or they had a divine appointment, then, you know, I can only praise God. So I'm thankful. So I look forward to coming back and, um, you know, teaching others how what I do to share Bible studies is one of my favorite presentations that I give. And I can't you know, wait. It can be wait. very interesting. It's not going to be boring. And so, yeah, look forward to it. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, yeah. Good. 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 Good.